also, you know, from just a, a, my experience, which I want to share with you today. Uh, so as Gal said, we're going to kind of give it in a lecture for the first 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for more questions. So I'm really glad for the 200. We've just reached 200 participants, and it's really nice to, to be here. It's evening right now here in Israel, but good morning to you guys over there in the States. So I want to start with kind of two comments. And the uh, first one is um, kind of a question maybe, and I know this might be relevant for the US as well as here in the Israeli context and maybe other co countries. And the question is, who haven't we been seeing in the press conferences? Uh, oops, sorry, I, I think I haven't corrected the, the spelling mistake here. Uh, so uh, who haven't we seen? We haven't seen uh, people, and I'm gonna kind of go off, off and on with the slides. Mikhail? Yeah? At the, uh, you yeah, took it? Yeah. Uh, yes. Ah, okay. We're gonna kind of keep them interested. So we're gonna put, the, put it on and off uh, with, the, with the slides. Um, so who haven't we seen in the press conferences? We haven't seen, at least not in Israel, and I'm pretty sure not in the US, we haven't seen those who are in charge of the psychological welfare of the people who are, we're trying to help. Some, someone from you know, the Ministry of Welfare, some, someone from the psychological services. This is a real issue all over the world. And you know, I watch the news every night here, at least in Israel, and they have these experts coming in to talk about physical health and epidemic and the, the, the pandemic and everything. And they talk about the coronavirus and they talk about the financial aspects, but we almost ha hear nothing about the psychological aspect, the, the aspect of well-being. And I really think that that is something that we, it's a problem because this problem is not just a problem of physical health and it's not just a financial issue. It's also an issue of, you know, the welfare of people and the, the psychological state of people. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing right now, at least in Israel, I'm pretty sure it's probably the same over there, is that those who are making, or the policymakers and the politicians are not paying enough attention to these, to these um, aspects of the crisis. So I think it's pretty much up to us right now as professionals to represent this standpoint and to understand what is going on and what we need to promote. So that is the first comment that I want to talk about. And the second, uh, the second comment I want to make um, is, just a second. Okay, the second comment I want to I wanna mention before we start is I'm calling you guys to believe us experts, you know, on the one hand, but on the other hand, remain critical at the same time. And why do I say this? I say this because we are right now facing a global a crisis, which have, we probably have not seen for the past, I don't know, experts are saying, you know, at least, I don't know, 70, 80 years at least, we're still not at the end of it, so I don't know what to compare it to. But uh, all of us experts, and I know I'm, I'm pretty young, but also people who are older than me say, we haven't seen anything like this. We haven't seen uh, something that affects so many people worldwide and has unfortunately um, uh, affected the health of so many people. So we don't really have right now what we call you know, evidence-based um, practice for dealing with coronavirus, right? But we do know things about other types of crises in mass trauma. And I think we have, we have learned a lot from that. And I'm gonna talk about what we do know today. And I think some of that will be applicable to, the, to what we're going through nowadays. Some might not be, and that's okay. So you guys, I urge you to remain critical. Maybe I will say something or a different expert who will say something that is not entirely relevant now. And that is okay. You know, we, we have to be really flexible here and we have to kind of figure the steps out as we go along. Because the truth is, and don't, don't let anyone tell you something is, the truth is we don't really have experience with something of this size okay so we're all kind of going to kind of doing the best we can under under the circumstances 
Okay, with that being said, well, it's going to, I'm going to start and uh, I want to continue and say that um, in 2007, there was a group of 20 world-renowned experts in the field of trauma uh, who published an article, which I'm going to base my lecture today uh, on. Um, and these were uh, five evidence-based guidelines for dealing with mass trauma. Now, this is the article, this is how it looks like, okay? Stephen Hopfel was their lead author, and we have 20 more, 19 more experts with him. And, um, and these, and also I will send Gale um, the, the presentation as well as this article, and she'll be, I'm sure, happy to send it to all of you when this is over. Um, now, what Hopfel and his associates did was say, you know, when we're talking about situations of like disasters and situations of mass trauma, we don't really have, the experts agree, we don't really have a good solid evidence-based uh, evidence based guidelines for dealing because, you know, the, the nature of this situation is that you don't start an RCT, you don't start a randomized controlled trial right after you had a, 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 a big uh, a natural disaster, right? And try to test out interventions and understand what works and what doesn't work. So when they say evidence-based, we're talking about evidence-based that is known to us from other types of traumas, other types of situations, okay? And what they did was say, okay, we don't really have good RCTs regarding mass trauma, but we do have knowledge from other types of trauma. We, we know from XPOWs, we know from people who have gone through a domestic violence, usually women. We know from a lot of about children a undergoing a domestic, um, undergoing a childhood abuse and neglect. So let's understand what, what are we talking about and, and what their ideas talk about the immediate and the medium term a handling of this of these sorts of uh, events. So we're going to talk today about these five essential elements that they're suggesting. I'm sure some will be uh, known to you guys as professionals, and, and and some I hope will kind of add to your knowledge after today. So the first principle I want to mention today is is promote a sense of safety. That's our first mission as professionals when we're talking about this sort of crisis is kind of trying to reestablish people's sense of safety. Now, this is very difficult um, right now because we're dealing with something which is totally invisible, right? And we don't know, at least for the, for the human eye, and we don't know much about. Uh, and what this, and we all know as professionals that what is happening right now is that this situation and I'm going to stop the presentation for a second. This, what, what is happening right now is that this situation is creating a threat on, our, on what Janet Blumen calls our basic assumptions, right? Those basic assumptions that go with us from the day we were born that protect us. These are not logical or rational assumptions, but these are assumptions that go with us and protect us um, from day one probably or from the day we start making sense of this world and we're talking about these ideas of thinking about the world as benevolent thinking about the self as capable thinking about the world as a world which is which is a meaningful in the sense that we kind of have these ideas where good things happen to good people bad things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people only when they weren't uh, when they did something wrong or they didn't take didn't take care. Now we all know that's obviously not true, right? But it's not. We have to understand this is not something that is logical. It's these it, it's these assumptions that guide us through life and allow us to function properly, even in the face of difficulties in in day to day hassles. But what happens in traumatic situations? What happens in traumatic situations is that we're going to go back to this for a second. Here it is. Is that what Janet Fullman calls the shattering, the shattering of these basic assumptions and this idea that we were going, we 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 were walking around feeling, you know, it's not going to happen to me, and suddenly it, it's gone, and it, it the the idea is in and suddenly the the world is, seems very very uh, scary. 
And this feeling is also, I was reading this interview a few days ago and this in, in, with one of uh, actually a US expert, and he was uh, talking about the fact that this situation that we're into is a situation where people are actually going through grief. We're, we're grieving our old lives, we're grieving uh, the things we cannot do anymore. And we're also, I think, grieving the loss of these assumptions that have helped us throughout life and have kind of had this protective shield around us, okay? And a lot of you guys who are working with trauma, you know what I'm talking about, okay? And we know this, the, the, uh, the, what happens with this protective shield is heard is that people usually, you know, we, we know these responses of the, the, the freeze, fight or flight. That's what we're, we're driven into automatically. And, um, and, and this kind of raised anxiety, that's something that we all know helps us in terms of survival, because if I'm in a jungle right now and a tiger is coming towards me, I really want to, you know, fly out of there, run out of there. Uh, but now in this sort of crisis, you know, our, our um, internal systems weren't probably built for a situation like this where we have to kind of stay at home, we keep feeling very alert, we're, we keep feeling not safe. And, and when this goes on for a long time, if we're talking about our clients, the people we're trying to help, this goes on for a long time. We know this may be problematic in terms of a, the developing PTSD, developing other problematic symptoms. So we really need to think about how to help people feel safe again, how to kind of recreate this protective shield. So let's talk about that because it's, it's not that easy. It's not that easy doing it uh, right now. And I think, unfortunately, the media isn't helping us that much also because they keep, you know, playing these, um, we, these interviews and keep bringing on people who kind of scare the public. And it's really hard to maintain the saints, the saints, the sense of safety. So I think we need to think about how to, um, how to help people, first of all, reduce obviously the amount of media that they're watching uh, because that that is probably not going to, you know, watching the news again and again is not going to promote a sense of safety. It's going to do the opposite. And we also need to understand that as the media has um, the, the exactly the opposite motivation compared to us as professionals, they want us to be actually more anxious because when we're anxious, rating goes up, we watch more news, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So uh, we need to think about the media. We need to think about the, the people that the talks that people are talking amongst themselves are not necessarily ha helping to promote the sense of safety because we, people are spreading fake news. People are kind of maybe hysterical, maybe panicking, maybe uh, telling other people things that are wrong. Um, so, uh, so just telling people, you know, talk to each other is not necessarily going to help them. We kind of need to think about what, what are people talking about? Are we helping? Uh, what messages are we bringing across to the people? Uh, because these conversations are not going to necessarily promote a sense of safety um, if we're not getting involved in there. We also need to think about people who right now their loved ones are in the hospitals or in other situations. Uh, how to get them the information? People need the information they need to understand what's going on with their with their loved ones. Uh, it's not so easy. Uh, it's it should be easy in these days, right? When we have the internet and we have a Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, but it's but sometimes it's not that easy, and we need to think about that as professionals. Um, so uh, that's the first principle we we need we talk about. I think that's obvious. That's pretty obvious for most of us. Let's go on to the second principle, which is to promote calming. Now, what is going on right now? We all, I think, everyone with us at this talk, as professionals, understand that the 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 anxiety levels that are going up right now for all of us, probably, and our clients as well. This is a norm. We all know it's a normal. Um, reaction to an abnormal situation, right? Our bodies were built this way. Our systems were built this way. But for talking about a long period of time, and uh, I don't know about you guys, but I think you kind of are a bit after what's going on here in Israel. I haven't left the house for 30, day, 30 days now, just outside of throwing the trash. 
And it, you know, we our systems were not built for 30 days or more of you know feeling high levels of anxiety. That also doesn't lead to good outcomes in terms of you know mental health in the long run. So we know it's a normal situation to an abnormal situation. We need to also, first thing is also we need to psychoeducate our clients about what they're feeling right now, about what their reactions um, might look like in this sort of situation, that it is a normal situation, a normal reaction, sorry, to an abnormal situation. That is the first thing we need to realize, right? The, the question is how much does this anxiety rise to and does it, and does it um, interfere with our day-to-day -day functioning? Okay, and we see, of course, different types of people dealing in different sorts of way. So when these anxiety levels are going up in a way that is going to hurt our functioning, we need to think about ways to help people calm down. And helping calm down, um, there are different interventions and, and ways we can do that. So this is really the types of interventions that, that, we, that we we're aiming towards are and some of them are not even, we don't have to be mental health professionals to, to kind of, you know, do our breathing, breathing exercises, yoga, and mindfulness, and grounding, grounding techniques, helping people realize where they are right now and that they are safe. And, but we really need to help. I know some of you are working in the school systems. I mean, this is something we need to really put in all levels I mean, I, I, my, my kids are now being, you know, schooled from home for, for the past th uh, three, or, three or four weeks. And this is something I would really love as a parent to see the system adopt. You know, I don't want them to just learn right now math and, and, and English and Hebrew and whatnot, but also putting in like these yoga lessons into the, the, the schedule. And also for us, for our students, for our clients, thinking about how to put that in their daily schedule because we really need to help people kind of calm down. Uh, for those of you who are um, mental health professionals, there's also a type of CBT intervention that is called SIT, which, is, which stands for Stress Inoculation Training. We don't have enough time right now to go over it, but if you guys wanna learn more about it, I urge you to read more about SIT, which is uh, known to help in these sorts of situations. And it's kind of uh, uh, an intervention where we help clients, we teach them about these different techniques for how to calm down, these breathing exercises and more exercises about helping people to calm down. By the way, humor is also a great tool. So, uh, so you know, even uh, join a Facebook group which is humoristic about the coronavirus. You know, I've joined a couple, I must say. Um, and, and, and also sometimes people get really overwhelmed because they feel like this is such a huge problem. How can I even start? You know, they worry about their parents, they worry about their children, they worry about their financial state. And sometimes we need to ask professionals kind of break down the huge problem into smaller bits and to smaller problems and kind of think about, okay, wait a minute, you're worried about your parents. Let's talk about them right now. Let's talk about who can bring them food. Do they have their prescription, uh, prescription medicine? Do we need to help them with that? Okay, so kind of breaking it down to smaller pieces because the, the situation can be very overwhelming because it's right now it's affecting all, all, all of us in all, in all the areas of our life. Um, so that can, can be overwhelming. Um, this, it's, calming down is also related to the amount of control that we're feeling. We're gonna talk about this soon. And I, I've even seen that there are apl relevant applications. There are uh, applications that help the uh, calming down. Uh, I haven't tried any, so I don't know, but you can also look into that. And it's another thing what we can try. So I'm gonna go to the third um, principle. And one of my personal favorites, which is promoting a sense of self and collective efficacy. Okay, so let's start with something kind of humoristic. This is a mem, um, and it starts out with, this is how my grandfather saved the world, right? This is what we're used to seeing, World War II, et cetera, World War I. And this is how I saved the world. Um, so that's a kind of humoristic side of it, but going back to what we want to talk about, we, I think most of us are aware of the concept that self of that Bandura uh, coined, which is self-efficacy, 
you know, the belief, our belief that our actions will lead to, to positive results, the results that we want to reach. Now, this is a very important part of dealing with these sorts of situations. Because what, ha what is happening right now is that all over the globe, um, people are telling us, the politicians are telling us, stay at home, okay? Don't go out, don't go to work, don't go to school, stay at home. Now, I am not debating the public health issue, and I, I'm guessing probably, I don't know, I'm not an expert on public health, but it seems to me that this is probably the correct thing to do in terms of the public's physical health, to stay at home, right? But let's talk for a second about, not about the physical health, but let's talk about the psychological aspects of telling people, don't go to work, don't go anywhere, stay at home and don't do anything. This is very problematic because if we're taking, people already feel that their, their sense of control is being taken from them. They can't control the things that they used to control in their day-to-day -day lives. We're taking that away from them. We need to give them something back. We need to really think about what they can do in this sort of situation and not just what they cannot do. The politicians, the policymakers, they keep saying again and again what you cannot do. And that is fine. I understand that they're trying to promote their agenda, but we really need to promote our agenda as mental health professionals and think about what they can do. Now, people can, even under the certain situations and under the limitations where we're, we're all under, can still do a lot of things. Okay, let's talk about, it, about the elderly. For example, we all worried about the uh, people who are um, or elderly, who are probably more, we, we see that they are, um, they get sicker and they are, they're more prone to, to physical complication with this virus. So we're telling them stay at home. And maybe, I know at least in Israel, we're bringing food to the doorstep and maybe we even have a volunteer which is calling them once a week. But Taking care, we all know Maslow's pyramid, right? Taking care of their basic needs isn't enough. And taking care of, of, of them and telling them, okay, we'll call you. We need to think what they can do. Maybe those elderly can volunteer and call other elderly people and see how they are doing, okay? Maybe the at-risk youth that we're used to helping in our day-to-day -day, uh, routine, um, maybe instead of just us calling them, asking how you are, maybe we can help them volunteer in these days, volunteer in calling each other, maybe create a buddy system where two people have, you know, have to take care of each other. And, and then they have to call us and kind of let us know what is happening, but not with them, but with their buddy. Okay, so we have to give people what to do, things to do to kind of main, help them maintain their sense of self-efficacy. And obviously their, the sense of collective efficacy, the collective efficacy is also related, okay? The idea that our, the actions of our community will also bring positive results. These two are connected together. And, 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 and when we're talking about community, it can be our geographic community where we live, or it can be a different kind of community that it's, it, we're now being, for example, if we're talking about parents for uh, children who, are, who have some sort of disability, maybe we can create a Facebook group, for example, for those parents and think about volunteering and, and how we're going to help each other. So what can people do? And let me tell you, I've worked with adolescent at-risk girls for 11 years in a specific program in which we've trained these adolescents to become mentors and to help other at-risk girls. Now, these adolescent girls came from very, very difficult backgrounds, from traumatic situations, undergoing abuse and neglect, and poverty. And you will not believe the incredible things that they did as mentors. And I know this principle works because I've seen it work for over a decade, not just with disaster, disasters, obviously, but for a, a other types of trauma. And if you give, it's so unbelievably helpful for people to help them, to give them something they can hold on to and not just be victims of the situations, which we kind of, I think, all feel right now, and it's a joint reality for all of us in this situation, but have something they can do, have a reason to get up in the morning, um, okay? And I think we need to think more and more about that direction as professionals. Um, 
this is really the time I'm going to talk about um, practices that are usually related to what we call community social work. But right now we all need to pitch in and that means, you know, setting up um, different, I don't know, different councils, different boards, different groups of volunteers. We need kind of set up these, um, set up these um, groups or WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups or whatever you guys are, whatever uh, technological uh, tool you will be using to kind of help people get together, think about ideas and do things for other people. It will be very helpful, not only for the people that they will help, but also from themselves. But I wanna also um, stress two things um, when I talk about this. And what I want to stress is that, I've, I've purposely stopped the, the presentation, is that talk, giving people what to do isn't enough. We need to remember two very important things. One is we need to give people the skills to do it. So not just um, tell them, okay, go ahead and call someone but we and, and see how they're doing. If they don't have the skills, they haven't got, undergone um, some kind of training, that that's not probably not gonna help their feeling of self-efficacy because the, 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 the conversation they're gonna do probably not gonna be the same, um, probably not gonna be maybe helpful or doesn't feel that they're doing the right thing. So we need to give skills. Okay, so if we're, for example, let me give an example. If we're bringing together a group of, uh, of 30 volunteers, so maybe we'll, we'll tell them this is a, a, we have three parts of this volunteering. The first part is kind of getting to know each other. The second part, we're gonna do training, including simulations, of telephone calls with possible with the elderly. And then the third part of volunteering is gonna do the actual volunteering and then, you know, kind of giving them ongoing supervision and help. Okay, so we need to give people the skills, not just leave them with the things that they need to do. And the, the other thing I wanna really stress is that, and this is what Hopful and his associates write in their article, is that empowerment with no resources doesn't do doesn't reach its goals so we cannot just empower people and tell them you know giving them these messages that it'll be okay and don't worry about it you guys are strong no we need resources and this is i think the governments are really worldwide are trying to deal with this issue and we need um we need financial assistance, right? We need to understand uh, what people will it will get from from the government, from the state, the federal level, the state level, um, but also give them resources to help. Okay, um, if it, sometimes you need to help them with a you know a license for Zoom to kind of to have a proper Zoom meeting and not one that ends after forty minutes. Okay, so give them resources. Um, and, and I really want to add things that I, I would have seen, I've read some of you uh, joining in have written to us where you work from, where you work. And I know that some of you are probably more used to one-on-one -on -one practice uh, in, or maybe more clinical practice in, in your daily routines. Now, let me say, um, I, I, I appreciate that. I think that's very highly important. You guys are highly skilled, but actually what the world needs from us right now, what our clients need from us right now is more community work. Is And I'll, I'll try to put it down even statistically. I mean, when you look at the US context, you're talking about, I don't know about, sorry, I don't know exactly, about 300 million people, right? Who are gonna be affected, who are affected right now by this virus but we don't have 300 million mental health professionals who will be able to sit with each one of them and go through therapy, right, and do all the things. So we kind of need to think outside the box here, okay? The numbers don't add up. We do not, I'm, I haven't checked this, but I'm pretty sure that the US does not have three, over 300 million mental health professionals. So we need to think, okay, how can we double our power? How can we triple it? And it's not by unfortunately working one-on-one. -on -one. I don't think that'll be enough. I think we kind of need to th think, how can we affect wider groups of people? For example, if we train 20 people to act as volunteers, okay, and uh, 
and to call people and see what they're doing. And then we're giving supervision to, I don't know, maybe split them up into smaller groups and giving. So those 20 people will reach 20 more people, or even 40 people, okay? And we're gonna reach amounts that we are not gonna be able to reach on one-on-one -on -one practice. So even if you're on your daily routine, you're not used to this kind of work, I think we really need to adopt these sorts of methods right now because this is what our clients need. This is what the world needs right now. And I think we really need to step up as professionals and say, okay, this is what they need right now. We're going to do it. Um, and I also think, you know, this is, by the way, the, we have a lot of NGOs who are already used to this type of work, right? Training volunteers doing that. So we can really learn from their experiences. We can uh, use their experiences and, and kind of learn from that because a lot of NGOs and a lot of other um, organizations already use these methods in their day-to-day -day routines. So we can kind of build on that knowledge. Um, okay, going back to our presentation here. Um, okay. Um, so let's go on to our fourth element, which is promoting connectedness. And I have chosen this uh, cute spider here uh, to kind of represent my point. Now we all know social support is a huge issue is a huge protective process when we're talking about dealing with trauma. I think that is known to all of us. It has been proven empirically time and time again, right? We don't need another research to prove that. We already know that. So people need other people. That is just a given. And people will, will come out of this crisis on the other side better off if they have human connections throughout this crisis. Now, what is going on right now with this specific um, uh, virus is that it's cutting off a lot of the connections, a lot of the natural connections that we're so used to in our day to day. It's cutting off children from their schools. It's cutting off people from their places of work. It's cutting off people from their places of worship. It's just cutting off all these connections. And now we really have this huge job of kind of being spiders right now and creating new, new kind of webs of social connections for our clients. That is our job right now, I think, at least one of our jobs. And when I mean human connections, it's not just a human connection with us as whether it's social worker or other type of mental health professionals, but I'm talking about more and more connections because if that person, our client, is getting one call a week, from us, it may be 50 minute long or 60 minute long, that is probably not gonna be enough. The loneliness, being at home for so many hours is so difficult. It is so against our human nature. We need to help them reconnect. And since their regular connections are now disconnected, we need to create new ones. So we need to have kids calling each other, and not just their friends, but calling those kids who nobody usually calls. Okay, we, I, I wish we, we, we will see teachers and school counselors, you know, creating these lists and making sure that we reach every child and every teenager. And, and I hope the phone, you know, and, and, and actually telling them, call people, not just WhatsApp. Yeah, God, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the watch. Don't worry. Not just WhatsApp, WhatsApp but actually phoning them, okay? It's so important. Um, okay. Let's go on to our final principle, our fifth and final one, which is to promote hope. Now, um, promoting hope, um, I, I Googled hope, and I was looking for a picture to put in this slide, in these slides, and I found this picture and many more uh, similar pictures. And I have to say it kind of made me really mad because this is not what hope is. And let me explain. I'll, let me explain what I mean. What we see here probably is, you know, this plant is kind of growing from a place where it probably wasn't supposed to grow against all odds or something like that. And that's very romantic, but scientifically that is not what hope is. Um, okay, and I'll show you a better, a, a better picture in a second, but uh, if we're talking about uh, Schneider's conceptualization of hope, uh, Schneider was one of the leading researchers uh, in, in the field of hope, and I know there's another presentation focused entirely on that. 
in, in uh, Haruf's uh, schedule. Uh, but Schneider defined hope as um, in encompassing um, the agency to reach certain goals and also the creation of different pathways to reach those goals. That is hope. And that means that, let me show it to you, it's a lot of work. It's not a, you know, let's look at this little, you know, it's, we're, we're facing this humongous mountain, okay, and we, we need to figure out different ways of getting there. It's, it's a lot of hard work to create hope. Right now, let's talk about the corona epidemic, for example. Okay, I'm going to give two examples, then we're going to open it up for questions. With the corona uh, um, virus, the, or the COVID-19, um, why are we right now hopeful? What are, why are we right now hopeful about the future? We're not sitting at home saying, oh, I wish this virus would just go away and everything will be better. No, the reason why we're hopeful, those of, those of us who are hopeful, is because we know there are teams of scientists around the world right now trying to figure out the best treatment plan protocol, trying to figure out, trying to prepare a vaccine. And we know this is going on all over the globe. And that is what keeping us hope, that is what is keeping us hopeful. So we have this goal, okay, of beating the virus. And we have agents who you all, we, all of us, over, a lot of millions of people right now worldwide want to do that, but probably billions even. And we have a lot, we have setting pathways of reaching that. Okay, there are all these labs doing all these experiences, and that is what hope is really is. So going back to, for, for us as, as people in the social arena, in the mental health arena, we need to help with our clients put down the goals and, the, and think about ways to get there. Okay, so if, for example, if someone really wants to study social work, uh, but doesn't have the grade point average to, to get there, so what she probably I would advise her is, you know, maybe you need to kind of uh, think about ways to uh, better your grade, your grade point average, maybe uh, go in and um, kind of get some ex hands on experience that may as a volunteer that maybe help you. Okay, we have all these uh, um, um, things you can do in Israel to kind of better your chances. But that is what hope is about. It's a lot of hard work setting those goals and setting a lot of different ways to get there. So with, with our clients and their day-to-day -day kind of handling um, the routine, I, I can tell you, I'm going to give one last example and then we're going to open it up for a question. For example, um, uh, with physical exercise, you know, uh, here in Israel, we're not allowed currently outside of our homes other than just 100 meters. And I used to, for the last six months, I've been running and they took that away from me. And it's really, it was hard. It was hard at first because I was, you know, used to running twice a week outside in the park. Um, and so I was, so at first week, week and a half, I would just let it go. And I was like, okay, let it go. But then I was thinking, okay, I really need to put exercise into my routine. I know it's helpful. I know it's going to help me. So I was thinking how to do that. So I developed kind of, that was my goal. And then I developed three different ways, okay, of how to do it. And finally, you know, I've started exercising in front of YouTube and finding all these, I found amazing stuff on YouTube. You would not believe you can get anything there apparently, even in terms of exercise. But I've tried a lot of things until I found something that works for me. So that is what hope is, is really about. Agency, pathways, and goals. So that's it for you for now. And Gal, maybe we'll open it up for questions now. Uh, thank you, Abita. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, what I must say that I really like the practical tools that you gave us. It's not just saying, okay, we are in this together, but I think that you gave some amazing ideas to people here, how we can make this period much better for all of us. Uh, so thank you for this. And Christina, are you with us? So as we did before, and for the one who, um, uh, it's, for, it's their first time, um, we have 223 people here, so we will not be able to hear you, but you can type your questions in the chat. And Christina, are you with us? Hi, girl, I'm here. So Chris, um, Avital, this is Christina, our GRA. Hello, uh, shalom. 
and uh, she will moderate the questions and she will and feel free to write your question uh, Christina is very good in this she's very rapid and it's your stage Christina all right so thank you so much Avital that was amazing um, I really enjoyed that we have two questions already the first one is how can social work use the disaster preparedness, psychological first aid, and other first responders models to create best practices that we can adapt to the pandemic situation with social distancing, et cetera? Okay, I think that that's basically what, what we've been talking about the last hour. And I think it, it is a challenge, okay? Let me, let me assure you, it is a challenge. A lot of the tools that we're used to, a lot of the skills that we're used to, it, we kind of need to rethink because some of us, you know, we, we have these tools of uh, dealing with disaster areas and where some of us know how to, you know, come into an area was, uh, it, where there's been an earthquake or a hurricane and we know what to do. But here we have with the social distancing, this is a really, really difficult issue. So I, I hope that in the, in the past hour, these, these elements that we've talked about, I, I do hope that they will help you out kind of figuring it out because we need to we need to help people maintain the the guidelines maintain the social distancing but create um kind of bridges that will overpass you know and with and and, and it, i think it is possible these days it is possible with the telephone and the internet and zoom and skype and all these things that we have um you know people are doing very creative things um, you know, I can tell you something, uh, my students, uh, my, my social work students who I teach, they've been home for the past month now, okay, and morale, I think, is kind of, was kind of going low, and, and just studying at home, it's not that fun, that much fun, it's much, I think it's, it, it's more fun coming to the, you know, to the university or to the college and meeting your friends, so, I mean, all of us professors, we made them this really kind of nice video clip that we sent them where it was, uh, for uh, for the holiday from us, it was something that they saw that we invested a lot of time into, and they were really appreciative of that. And I'm just giving it as an idea of something different. And I want to give another idea is that we really need to think outside of the box. I think with this with this epidemic, and 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 not just think outside of the box. But I want to say one more thing, which might help you guys. Um, I, and I know this tip has been helpful in, in kind of um, things that we've done uh, in Israel, is that us as professionals, we usually have pretty strict ideas of what is considered therapy or what is considered therapeutic, right? We, we, we're kind of real strict on, you know, setting and, you know, all that, what we, what we do, what we do not do as part of therapy. What I really need to say, what I want to what I want to urge you guys is kind of we need to stretch our idea of what is therapy and what is therapeutic right now because just talking with someone for 50 minutes or 60 minutes will not necessarily be what is most helpful right now so if for uh, I was asked you know by a social worker who's dealing people who are uh, dealing with mental health issues who are in the community okay not hospitalized they're being rehabilitated in the community. They're stabilized, but um, you know we need to help them right now. So I was telling her maybe even do like a, a cooking a session. Like they like to cook. You can be in your kitchen. They can be in theirs. Let's you know cook together. And in a in a normal situation, maybe cooking together wouldn't be something appropriate. Something that we do. This is something you need to you know take to your organizations, take to your supervisors, and kind of be more flexible, less strict, and stretch out the idea of what is therapeutic. People will need really basic things from us, and I think we need to give them that. We really, I'm not sure they need from us, you know, going back to their pasts and all that right now. You know, they need to kind of make it through the day. And we need to do whatever we can do to help them kind of make it through the day, even if we, we normally would not do that in a normal therapeutic relationship. So Christina, maybe another question? Thank you, Avital. Also, Jordan said that they appreciate your, uh, your go-getter Israeli spirit. So I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> Thank you. 
And another participant said, I really like the way you consider the many layers we must consider, which each of the topics you presented, giving us increased ideas and reminders, our jobs aren't a one-stop shop. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so for that Of course. Another question we have, could you cite the evidence-based research you discussed at the beginning? Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send Gal uh, the, the article by Hobsl and his associates, and you guys are welcome to read it. All the five principles that I've talked about today aren't my ideas, they are their ideas, and these are all evidence-based. All the five principles that we've talked about today, so I, I just kind of brought it to you, but we have 20 experts in the field of trauma who have signed their names on these five principles. So th these are all evidence-based guidelines and I'll send the article to you and you guys are welcome to quote it and go back to your organization services, pass it on because I think this is a, you know, this is a, such, a, such a great set of tools um, and, and quite simple even I think uh, that will really help a lot of people. That's what I feel, hopefully. Thank you. The next question is, for those who are not in the first or second wave who get back, who get to go back to work, how should they keep their hope alive? Okay. Uh, yeah, I know, I know for a lot of us, um, and I can totally relate on a personal level as well, we're kind of looking into the future and saying, okay, when will this end? When can I go back to work? When can I go back to the daily routine? And right now, uh, I don't know about the US, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same over there. Uh, I've been following also, and also here in Israel, the policymakers do not have clear answers for us. They, they don't really know. And, the, and why they don't know is that they really are, they wanna understand how this thing progresses and um, what is going on. They really need to slow it down and you guys all know probably the, the ideas behind the social distancing and everything. And, and, and they don't have answers because they don't really know. We have a few countries in Europe who have started to kind of, um, kind of let the public do some of the things, okay? But, but that's on a very small scale. The, the, good is for you, the good news is for you guys in the US is that in Europe, you know, they're ahead of you guys. So we're gonna see, all of us are gonna see what's going on in Denmark and in Germany who have already started in Spain, have already started certain steps. And, and that's, that, that is helpful, I think. Um, knowing that uh, um, countries have already started kind of going back, not to regular life, but to a more regular routine. But going back to the question I was asked, you know, uh, I, I, used to t I take my students once a year to watch, um, uh, to observe an, an, an NA meeting. Um, um, and they have a great saying, you know, they have, you know, uh, about letting, I don't remember right now, but about letting go with the things that I cannot control and, and, you know, thinking about the things that I cannot control and thinking about just for today, you know, they will always say, I am clean for these many uh, days, weeks, months, years, just for today. And I kind of took that saying, you know, I, I, I do not participate in NA or AA, but I think that's a good saying for all of us right now. I mean, we need to make a plan for today. We need to make the plan for tomorrow. Don't think two months ahead. Don't think two weeks ahead. Um, it, it's not helpful right now. It's not helpful. We need to think about today. We need to think about tomorrow. Okay, don't think about that much time ahead. Um, Think about how you're going to make a better day tomorrow. How are you going to keep your routine? How are you going to help your clients, your kids? Um, that is the best we can do right now. Thank yes, you. The serenity prayer. Thank you for those in the, in the chat room. Awesome. Does anyone else have any more questions? I, I can at least give you one hope and is that Avital is going to be in the United States in Tulsa next year uh, from August. So remember her. And as Haruv is giving lectures all over, she will be able to come to your agencies and give lectures in other, uh, other uh, topics also. Uh, but she is the hope and resilience in the, um, investigator. So 
uh, researcher, sorry. So um, this is one hope that I can give it to you. Uh, Christina, do, do we have any more questions or we are going to finish this session? I don't see any more questions right now. I see a lot of people saying thank you. This was an excellent presentation. They appreciate your ideas and your support. Um, so if there's no more questions, we can go ahead and give the information about CEUs. Okay, so thank you, Avital. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, anyone wanna open the microphone and say something? Uh, we have uh, one, two minutes for this. Okay, so thank, thank you. Thank you, Jill Corbin. Thank you, I miss you. <laughs> and uh, Avital, this I is the you moment too, that you can... <laughs> Okay, uh, Avital, we are going, thank you very much again, and we are going to continue with some information about CEU, so you can leave us. And okay, thanks. I just wanna say, just wanna say one, maybe one last thing before I go, and thank you for you guys in the chat for uh, all your kind words. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I really hope this will be helpful uh, for you guys. And, and pass it on to your organizations, to your services, to your families and communities, because we really need to step up here I'm not sure the, the policymakers are, are that much interested or that much responsible for public's uh, mental health. But one thing I will say is, and I think all experts agree on this, we will make it, we will survive, A human, the human race will survive, and most of us will see the end of this from the other side. A, almost all of us will, okay? It's, it's scary and it's not easy, but we'll make it through. Uh, all the experts agree on that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.